Mary Coe. I am from the Fairfield Woods Branch Library. Uh, very happy to be one of the co-hosts of this program tonight, which was originally supposed to be presented in person um, at the Fairfield Public Library back in March of 2020. Um, I don't think I need to tell you all why it didn't happen. It was right around the time the library had to close. Um, it's being presented in partnership with some wonderful people and organizations. Uh, one of the organizations is the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. And of course, we have the Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental, Environmental Protection. Um, the idea for this program, I believe it all began uh, when State Representative Jennifer Leeper reached out to our presenter tonight, Cheryl Baldwin of the CTDEEP to bring her wonderful um, What's In, What's Out recycling program uh, to, the, to the town. And we are really honored to have our two state representatives uh, here tonight. We have Representative Kristen McCarthy Vahey. Um, welcome, it's nice to see you. And we have Representative Jen Leeper. I will turn it over to you so you can introduce our speaker. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Mary. I'm thrilled um, that this event was able to happen. We are so lucky to have a true expert here with us tonight. And I'm honored to introduce Cheryl Baldwin. Cheryl has worked in sustainable materials management for over 30 years and has been at DEEP since 2008. Her current projects include Increased Recycling work, Working Group for the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management, the Recycle CT Foundation, the What's In, What's Out initiative, which we will all benefit from tonight, and Yay. the CT Wrap Program. Cheryl facilitated the creation of a universal list of acceptable recyclables for Connecticut in partnership with materials recovery facilities. She provides professional development for municipal recycling coordinators, and she is on the CT Green Leaf Schools Advisory Council. She's also a founder of EcoWorks, a creative reuse center that, for the arts in North Haven, and she received an MS in resource development at Michigan State University and a BA in solid waste management from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, thank you so much, Cheryl, for being here and sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jen, Representative Leeper. It I sound so amazing when you read that. That, that sounds great. Thank you. So you are, you um, are I just wanted to say, <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for everyone who is here tonight. You've given up a beautiful evening in the spring uh, to hear all about recycling, which of course is my favorite topic. So thank you so much for taking the time out and learning a little bit more. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I do have our PowerPoint so I can uh, share a little bit more with you about recycling. And um, so my name, of course, is Cheryl Baldwin, and I'm going to just jump right in with what is recycling. So we often think about we prepare all of our bottles and cans and we throw in some cardboard and we put it in our blue bin or maybe your bin is green. Um, and then you maybe it's a cart. You either bring it to the transfer station or maybe it's picked up on your at your curb. Well, that is recycling, but is much, much more than that. We as consumers or residents are definitely at the cutting edge. We are at, at a vital point in the, in the system. But if you look at the top here, where we have collection, that is an important part, but it's only part of a broader system where that material is then picked up by a hauler or a collector. And then that material is brought to a MRF or a materials recycling facility or materials recovery facility. And that is where materials are sorted and processed, where materials come in and they go up on a conveyor belt and people pick manually. They either pull out bad stuff or they pull out good stuff and they put it down a chute. And then it co continues up on a series of conveyors where things are pulled off by a magnet or they're blown off because they're light 
and then they're separated. And then the facilities have to do something called meta specification. And what that means is the people they're trying to sell it to have asked them to make a particular size box of materials. And in this case, it's a bale. And so if we look at over here, all the way to the left on the bottom, you can see right here, that is a bale. Bales are sometimes three feet by three feet by three feet. Sometimes it's four by four by four with wires around it. Well, every company has their own specifications, how big, how heavy, how much contamination can go in. And so our facility operators need clean materials so they can meet the specification because then they wanna sell it to an end market, also known as reclaimers. These are the folks that take that raw material and sometimes they make it right into a product or sometimes it's two stages. And in this case, we have plastic as an example. So they make it into a plastic pellet and then they sell it to a manufacturer that makes it into a jug. And then somebody buys that because they fill it with milk. And then what do we do? We buy that milk and thus we complete the cycle because once we finish that milk, it's gonna be put into our, our recycling bin. And so we need all of it, collection, sorting, meeting that specification, selling that material, make it a new product, and then buying that new product. And so when we think about um, purchasing, uh, it's a little crazy right now because of COVID. Most of our purchases may come to our door in a box, but in, uh, in our normal life, we often go to the hardware store or we'll go to a, a department store or we'll go to a clothing store or we'll go to a shoe store. And all of those materials come in from different places into our homes. Likewise, when they leave our homes, they're also going to multiple, multiple places. And so don't just think of it as trash and recycling. It is much more broad. So if we start on the left here, we see a big trash bag, and then we have a recycling cart. This is for our mixed recyclables or our single stream. But you know what, we also have brush. Maybe you uh, donate some textiles, clothing, linens, shoes. Again on the left, plastic film, plastic bags, another film that would go back to retail stores food scraps. Maybe your town collects food scraps. Isn't that great? Or maybe you do food scraps at home for composting. If not, they should go in the trash. And then we have bulky collection, mattresses, electronics, so many other different materials that could be recovered, but it's separate from the recycling cart. And then of course we need Oscar because um, I just like Oscar the Grouch. So if we are thinking about collection historically of how materials were collected, some of us may be old enough to remember when we did source separating. We had to tie up all of our newspapers and we actually had to separate it from magazines, if you recall, and they were pretty adamant that you had to pull out the circulars. Well, we don't do it that way anymore. We moved on to a thing called dual stream where we now put all of our newspapers and magazines in one bin and then we put our bottles and cans in the other. Or sometimes it was separate weeks. One week it was bottles and cans and then the next week with newspaper, depending on where you live. And then they said, you know what? We have the technology to separate it all so we can mix it all together. But ultimately, whether it's mixed recycling or sometimes known as single stream, it's basically the same materials that we're putting in there. A lot of people ask questions about um, are we doing bad things now that we have single stream? Well, single stream has been beneficial in a number of ways. One, it does require less space and equipment for collection and storage. We only have one truck coming down as opposed to two. However, it can lower the value of those commodities because of potential more contamination. And the higher contamination did lead issues related to China's national sword, which you may recall started back, um, actually it started back in 2017, but really made the news in 2019 about China stopping our, accepting our recyclables. And really what it was is that there was so much contamination in our recyclables, and this is countrywide, it's not just Connecticut. And so they, they did start uh, reducing the amount that they wanted. 
coming in as an import from the United States. So where are end markets? How is recycling going? Is our stuff being sold or is it just being dumped? And what's the impact of the China's national sword policy and the COVID pandemic? And are there any domestic markets? I can tell you things are looking very good. There may be a cost associated with trash disposal and we still have a fee associated with recycling, but the markets are stronger and they're going higher. I do apologize. Some of the market information I have is a little dated. We just passed through the first quarter of 2021. So my information is mostly from the end of 2020. Um, but generally what you can see, because I'm assuming you don't really care about the, the specific details, but it will give you a sense of um, sort of the strength of markets and the increase in domestic markets that we are having. Um, we usually we start with fiber because fiber is um, more, is almost half of all of our recyclables that come into the recycling facilities. And so what we can see in 2020, we had a lot of facilities starting and opening in the country, which is amazing. And we do have a couple of them in Mexico, but it'd be basically more facilities in North America is a good thing for us and our recycling programs. In 2021, we have a lot more facilities that are coming online, which is fantastic, and lots more planned in 2022. While these, don't, these lists don't provide the details, some facilities are providing, um, are collecting only cardboard. Some are only doing paperboard, which would be like cereal box, and others are doing just mixed paper, and others are taking all of it. And so overall, it is definitely helping the fiber market. So a lot of people wanna know about plastics. While plastics is actually one of the smallest portions of the recycling stream, uh, everybody's concerned about plastic because of contamination and because of issues with debris, marine debris and litter. So markets um, are pretty good for plastics. If you wanted to know the details, certain things like milk jugs are a little bit higher than uh, soda bottles, but that's just when you kind of get into the weeds. But the big thing to know is we have a lot of facilities that are coming online or have just come online domestically in this country to handle our materials. And we have more facilities coming online, which is a really exciting thing. So markets are good, markets are increasing. And then you have to say, oh, are we doing it right? Uh, the answer is yes. But the answer is, but it's hard. And there's a lot of reasons why it's so challenging. Um, I, this slide is uh, very busy, but basically it's coming from the USDA or the Department of Agriculture. And what it's telling us is that we have uh, five to 10,000 new products go to our retail shelves every year. I'm just gonna let that sink in. We have like 5,000 to 10,000 new products coming onto our retail shelves every year. Do you think they're having conversations with me about what packaging is coming into Connecticut? Do you think that they're having conversations with our MRF operators or any MRF operators in the country? The answer is no. There's definitely a disconnect. So you might have a really talented you know, packaging engineer that has come up with something beautiful and lightweight, but it's not acceptable in the program because there's no way of recovering it or there's no way of actually using it and making it into a new product. And so there's definitely a disconnect. Um, and that is a problem. And so we rely on uh, manufacturers and packaging uh, product manufacturers to come up with good labeling systems. So I'm gonna ask everybody to take a deep breath because I don't want to scare you, but I know that everybody is familiar with the chasing arrows, right? And then there's like a little number in the, in the center. That is referred to as a resin code. And while we may have used that code in the 90s to help 
give us a sense of what type of plastic it was in. And we would say, number ones and number twos are in. There are so many new packaging products out there with a range of resin, resin types and resin codes. You cannot use it as a guide to help you with recycling. You just can't. So I ask you to stop using that as a guide to help you determine whether or not it's in or out. All right, another deep breath. Many of us have been using those for a long time, and so we need to move away from them. In fact, California is talking about legislation to get rid of them because they're so confusing. Instead, I encourage you to think about the how to recy recycle label. More and more manufacturers are using this label, and it's much more descriptive. It actually helps us. It tells us what it is. It's a plastic bottle. It tells us what to do, empty and replace cap. And it's not just for plastic, it's for all things, including metal cans and sometimes cereal boxes. Again, it identifies what it is and it tells us what to do. So that is extremely helpful. All right, I do work for the department, so I have to let you know, or maybe I have to ask you, did you know that recycling is mandatory in Connecticut? By now, if we were in person, I'd want to see a, a row of hands, but I can only see like eight people at a time, so I don't know if you're raising your hand, but the answer is yes, it is mandatory in Connecticut. And so now I'm going to ask you, when did the law pass? Did Connecticut pass a law in 1975 mandating recycling? Or was it 1989? Or was it 2012? I wish I knew what you were saying. I would love to know what your, your, your thought process was, but I am just gonna give you the answer. There's usually a few people that are wrong on either side and then a few people that are right. So 1989 is the correct answer. And anytime you hear about how amazing California is, I just have to tell you, Connecticut has had mandatory recycling since 1989. And it's not just like businesses have to recycle or you know, uh, homeowners have to recycle. It says everyone must recycle. So we are in this together. And it is very uh, progressive. Little bit of a trick because in 2012, Connecticut added a few more things to the mandatory list. So what's the list? This is the list. These are all the things that are mandated by law. So if you generate this material, you should not be putting it with your trash and you should be recovering it for recycling. And then if we cut this list and we look at just the top, this is what goes in our blue bin. This is the materials for our mixed recycling. This is our single stream. Nothing's changed since our dual stream program. We have containers, glass containers, metal containers, and plastic containers. And the way to think about plastic containers is are they a jug, a jar, a bottle, a tub, or a deli container? then they're in. And most every other plastic item is out. There's a few, a few exceptions, but most things are not gonna be in. I'm just gonna let that sink in. Don't get too sad. Don't, so I, I you, again, a deep breath, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, I still throw those things in. And that's okay, because today it just means we're gonna get better, because you're taking time out to learn about recycling. I'll say and that again, because I think stuff. a lot of people want to hear, say that same thing again, what's in, what's out for plastic, because I think a lot of people are so confused on that. Yeah, we're going to go over it so many times, you're not going to, you know, we're, we're going to keep going over it. <laughs> but the basic thing is, it's containers. It's containers, it's containers, it's containers. So if it has a neck, or if it's a tub, a jug, a jar, or bottle, it's in. And if you tell me, but it has that recycling arrow with the number in it, remember, it doesn't matter. It's just telling you what type of plastic resin it is. 
It's not telling you whether or not it's acceptable. And so the difference is, is whether or not it's acceptable in the program versus recyclable. This is a list of tons of recyclable items, but they're not acceptable in your blue bin program. They're not acceptable in the cart. We can recycle cell phones and electronics and paint, and mattresses and textiles and food scraps. All of this material is recyclable, but it's not acceptable in our blue bin. So I'm just gonna take a moment. We talk a lot about recycling, but I just wanna remind you that recycling is actually um, the last R. That really what we need to do is take a moment to rethink, refuse, reduce, to reuse, and recycle. And some hints for you. Purchasing is a big one. I know before I buy, I always say, do I need it or do I just want it? And can I buy it locally? Can I buy it used? Can I repair the one I already have? Could I borrow it from a friend or a neighbor? Or maybe the library has one I could borrow. With food, we waste a lot of food in this country. And while we may collect food scraps for composting or you know, food scrap collection programs, it first starts with reducing the amount of food that we are wasting. And so it's great to put an apple core and a banana peel in our compost pile, but we shouldn't be putting all the food that we just bought into the compost bin. Best to make a shopping list first, maybe create a menu for a few days or a week, freeze items before they go bad, rotate food in your refrigerator. Okay, I don't do this, mark items. This picture, a, a, little, a little too detailed for me, but you know, you get the gist. And then, of course, learn to compost. Or maybe you could be part of the Clean Plate Club. Only eat everything that's on your plate. And if you don't want to gain weight, start using smaller plates. And then what about reuse? Maybe consider donating items you no longer need or donate responsibly because not all organizations want our, sorry, crap. And so make sure that when you are donating certain items that the nonprofit organization is actually seeking those materials. Learn how to repair the item. Maybe organize events in your community, town-wide tag sales or swap events, or repair cafes, or set up a little mini library, not to be in competition with our public library, but they are great in the community and they create you know, a good Mary, thank you for that, because this one's mine. This is what my husband made me last summer. And while people, it takes a little bit to get used to it, it eventually people get it because libraries are so important. And then at the end, I have a whole list of things that libraries do beyond just books. Sometimes we have tool lending libraries or maybe they lend cookware. Uh, I'm in New Haven, so we actually have cake pans, maybe paintings or other artwork. There's a huge thing that libraries do much more beyond than just books. So, I just wanna give you some background because whether you, are, whether you realize it or not, I know that um, Jen uh, introduced me with that. I helped harmonize and create a list. And it was really because of partnership with the MRF operators. We have five companies that run a number of facilities in Connecticut. And originally every town had a different rule for what to put in, even though often we were all going to the same facility. It was like a game of telephone in the old days. A lot of miscommunication. So what we ended up doing is we went through a whole list of products and I really wanted to know from the facility operators what materials are coming in that are harmful to your employees? What are things that are coming in that are causing safety concerns? What are things that are coming in that are causing concerns to your equipment or causing it to shut down? And then also what are materials are coming in that are reducing the value of your commodities? Remember the circle of what is recycling? If they can't sell it, then there's no reason for them to accept it. And so what they decided is that they're accepting a lot more than just what is mandatory because the markets are good and they want that material. And that's how we came up with the list. And a study in 2015 
found that these are the top contaminants, meaning these are the top things that should not be in our recycling bin that were entering our recycling bin um, back in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 before we started the program. Plastic bags being the big one. Shredded paper causes a lot of problems. Uh, really a health issue if you went into the facilities, there'd be so much dust in the air and it was really caused by shredded paper. Every time they compacted or moved things, a puff of, of this white smoke would come up and it was really just small particulates of paper. Bagged recyclables or bagged waste is a huge issue. Tanglers are a problem. Anything that tangled in the equipment, garden hoses, hangers, clothing, and then bottle caps. Bottle caps are so small, they actually contaminate the glass. So another quiz, which is which? Which is the bagged recyclables and which is the bagged trash? Of course, it's a joke because it's the same photograph. So again, think about the conveyor belt, right? The, con the materials are coming up on the conveyor belt. Our neighbors and friends who are working there are picking out the stuff and then a big bag comes up. They don't have time to open it up. They can't tell the difference if it's trash or beautiful clean recyclables. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna throw it away. So please do not bag your recyclables. And if your hauler says you need to bag them, then you need to notify the department because they are going against the regulations and the rules of how to cover, how to recover this material. All the facility operators have agreed on this list. And if haulers, haulers can't make up um, a, a, any changes themselves, it, it's a, it's a, it's a well, it's a well-run list. It was, I mean, excuse me, it's a, it's a great list that was created by the MRF operators and we can't let a couple of haulers sort of control the conversation. And I would love to have a conversation with them and help them understand the program if you do have such a hauler. Whoops. Oh, sorry, I hit my wire there. So, um, oh, sorry. I'm trying to sit far away because later I'm gonna give you a quiz and I want some space. Um, oh yeah, did I mention I have a quiz for you? I know, it's not very nice, but I'm giving you a quiz anyway. So um, just a reminder, don't bag your recyclables. And this is why. This is part of the conveyor belt system. And you'll see all here is gears that are filled with plastic and other tanglers. And do you see this bright yellow spot? That's a man. That's a man that had to climb into that sharp machinery to manually cut off plastic bags and other film. Every facility has to take a 15 minute break in the morning and in the afternoon and then an hour at lunch. And two guys have to remain in the back and they have to spend time cutting all that film off. So think about if you, I don't know if any of you run your own business or you're in business, but can you imagine shutting down your business for that much time every day? Think about the loss in productivity. And I was there for 15 minutes and that was all the crap you cut off. That's a lot. And it's not, it, you know, it's not safe for him to like jump into that machine. You know, we can see like warning, this is sharp. You can see right in the photo. And this poor guy has to jump in there. So it should be a motivator for us to stop bagging our recyclables and stop putting plastic bags in our recycling bin. So we created a new universal list. The main thrust of the initial program was just to help municipalities understand that we're really trying to create this, uh, this universal list. Um, I think every all the municipalities are using it now. It did take a couple of years for everybody to sort of abide. I think a huge bulk started initially, and then some folks had already just come out with new educational materials. And so gradually we are all now going in the same direction, which is fantastic. So some initial changes are all pizza boxes are in. I'm from New Haven, you gotta say that like five times. All pizza boxes are in. 
we just don't want your food, we don't want your crumbs, and we ask that you remove the liner. Black plastic containers, initially they were in. And then in 2016, when we, uh, excuse me, 20, 2018, when we had a conversation with the MRF operators to do a follow-up, they all felt that while they originally had agreed on black plastic, they no longer wanted it. Do, do I want to create changes in the, the list? No, I don't want to create changes, but there you are. They needed a change, and so we accommodated. Because if again, if they can't sell the materials, then none of us are recycling. And then ultimately out, of course, is loose bottle caps, shredded paper, no plastic bags, and no polystyrene or styrofoam. They just don't want it. Doesn't matter what type of container or anything, they just don't want it. And some things are just meant for the trash can. Single-use cups, lids, straws, moldy textiles, pens, pencils, toothbrushes, broken garden hoses, pop balloons, polystyrene, insulating foam. You know what? Some things are just meant for the trash can. So why does quality matter? We're at the front end. We need to do a better job so that we're providing really good materials to make it easier for the facilities to sort and process so they can meet their specification, so that they can sell that product, so that that product can be made and then put back on the shelf so we can buy it. This is glass. This is referred to as MRF glass. And that's because what happens for the facilities is everything gets pulled out and glass is the last thing because it's the heaviest. And so all the little bits and pieces end up going with the glass. Toothbrushes, prescription bottles, razors, toothpaste, lip balm, batteries, bottle caps. All of that is a contaminant that goes in. I don't care if it had a, has a recycling arrow on it. I don't care if you wish it got recycled. I don't care if you think it should be recycled. Please don't put it in your recycling bin. And then there are other things to not to put in your recycling bin. You know, it, you got to remember that our friends and neighbors are doing uh, the sorting manually. And if you, we are putting lithium batteries in there, they're going to start fires and explosions, and they're going to cause some safety concerns for not only our MRF operators, but for our trash haulers too. And I don't know if Fairfield have, has municipal collection, but you got to think about your, your town workers as well. And then there are other items. Um, when I talk to the MRF operators, I'm like, there's no way that stuff comes in. And they're like, oh yeah, no. Lawnmower blades are really big in the summer. I don't know why that is, but it is. Um, they get propane tanks, which is a problem. They get ammunition. Please don't put your ammunition in the recycling bin. They get diapers. It's like, oh, come on. They don't want that stuff. Again, they're manually sorting that. So please keep that stuff out. And so this is the Recycle CT webpage, and um, it provides the list. And it also has this thing called the Recycle CT Wizard, which is a search tool. And this search tool can be put on any web page that's run by a municipality. We have a number of uh, towns that are putting this on their web page, as well as haulers and collectors, and even nonprofits that are just um, trying to spread the word. And so if Fairfield doesn't have it, you could of course put it on your town webpage. And it basically helps you understand what's in or what's out and when you might need to contact a recycling coordinator for more specific information. So if you don't remember anything today, I ask you to think about before you put it in your bin, think about is it acceptable versus recyclable? And now I'm gonna give you a quiz I hope you're ready. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can see each other. And by all means, I don't know how we're gonna be able to do it, but um, maybe thumbs up is in and thumbs down is out. Okay, so is everybody ready? Did, do you think you learned something tonight? I'm gonna to start you off easy, okay? All right, these are uh, circulars. These are flyers that came in the mail. 
in or out. Excellent. These are in. Pizza. In or out. In. And just so you know, no liner and there's no crust. I eat my crust. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to be a little bit more challenging. A coffee cup. This is a polystyrene or a styrofoam. Oh, yeah, but it's clean. It's clean. No? Okay. Out. That out. is out. Milk jug? In. In or out? In. Yay. I see all those thumbs up. Yay. Thumbs up. Let's see. What else? I have a bag of beautiful recyclables. Everything's been rinsed and clean. Yeah, but they've been rinsed. They're clean. I got like clean stuff in here. All right. All right. There, you're right. It's out. It's out. Let's see. A hanger? Out. out. Correct. Out. Oh, but now I've got a wire hanger, right? Metals, metals um, recyclable, right? Oh, okay. You're right. That's out. Uh, garden hose? Out. It's plastic. <clears throat> Correct. It's out. All right. So now we're going to get hard. Are you ready? A spray bottle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that, Charles. Sideways. I don't know. <laughs> no top. You have to throw the top so out. This, you are correct. Right. <laughs> so, um, Nice, to, nice going, Charles. So usually what, um, you could put the whole thing in, but it's actually better to take the sprayer off and just put in the bottle. So this is in and this is out. All right. This is plastic. It's uh, from mayonnaise. It has a lid and it's got a number on the bottom. In or out? In. Oh, everybody's hesitating. Is this is a container. This is a jar, and this is in. Okay. What about the Just lid? Like this is a jar. The lid is okay as long as it's on. So, um, no loose bottle caps. So, this is a glass jar, in or out? In. In. And so now I have a metal, I have a loose cap. Out. Correct, out. Oh, but I have a cork. I have three corks. I can do a craft project. Should I put it in or out? I think I'm Correct, out. out. There's a beer drinker in my, my, my family. In or out? out? Correct, out. All right, now we're getting really hard. Are you ready for this? This in. is a pr Pringles can. It's got metal on the bottom. Feels like cardboard and it's got like metallic stuff on the inside. In. 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 It's actually out. Out? So mm. these are apparently MRF operators hate them because they are mixed container and this is metallic in the center, and this is metallic in this, this, um, so they, this is out. And it would be the same for my oatmeal container. Oh. I know. However, this mm. type of oatmeal, some oatmeal has plastic on the bottom mm. and then plastic. This one does not, but it does have a lip. So I'm going to assume most people in here are uber recyclers. I'm just guessing. <laughs> so if you want to, it's better to keep contaminants out. But if you are very particular and you want to do your, you know, go beyond the beyond, I actually pull this plastic lip off and then I put it in because it's all cardboard. But the Pringles can has too many other contaminants. This would also be like peanut. Uh, cans of peanuts or um, raisins. 
sadly, um, these are not acceptable. Let's see. I have a, a sock that's ripped. Ow. Ow. What else could I do with it? <laughs> I could make a puppet. You could also donate it. So if you weren't aware, textiles, they can take ripped things and they can even take single socks and single shoes. And so this could be actually part of a textile recycling program. Just, just while she's getting the next item, we do have a textile recycling program at our transfer station that is run by Bay State. And you can take all of your ripped socks and any other textiles and many other uh, sort of soft things there, uh, such as stuffed animals, that, towels and that's sheets. That's great. <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to li list a few more things and then we'll open it up for questions. So this is an air, these are air pillows. If you get a lot of packages, you might get them. Are these in or out? Out. You are correct. They are out. What else could I do with them? These are just like plastic bags. These are plastic film and can be returned to the participating retailers that take our plastic bags. The only thing is you need to pop them. And I would imagine that there's somebody in your family that will love that job. Okay. Uh, this question always comes up and I am sorry because you guys are gonna hate me afterwards. Prescription pill bottle, in or out? Out. Out. It's out. I have a little spice bottle, in or out? In. It's actually out. Okay. okay. I have a big vitamin jar. This is in. Oh, good. And then I have another vitamin jar, and this is in. And I'll tell you why. Again, if you are not an Uber recycler, just throw them all away. Don't even put them in the recycling bin. But if you're an Uber recycler and want to understand why, do you remember I said that all the glass ends up at the bottom and all the contaminants go into the glass? That's because glass is last because it's heavy and it goes through a grate. And the grate is two inches by two inches. So imagine all of these, of course, are holes and all the glass gets shot through those. And that's why we have batteries and uh, pens and pencils go through because they go through the grate. And that's why prescription bottles are not acceptable. Prescription bottles may be recyclable, but they're not acceptable because they contaminate their glass because they go through the container and it goes through the container. But bigger ones do not go through. And that's why they're in. And so again, if this confuses you, just throw it all in the trash. But if you wanna be an Uber recycler, just know if it goes through a two by two inch grate, it is considered out. I know, it's very sad. It gives us a sense of why we need to increase our conversations with packaging manufacturers. And packaging manufacturers need to have a better understanding of how our MRFs run. And while we may have some state-of-the-art MRFs um, in Connecticut, in fact, we have a new one that's gonna be opening up this year. I often think about it like hiking. I don't know how many people take walks or hiking, but you never have the slowest hiker in the back. Why? Because you might lose them. You always have the slowest hiker in front because you're hiking together and you follow the pace of the slowest person. And likewise, I think the MRF operators, we need to recognize some of the MRFs, um, you know, may be the lowest common denominator, so to speak. And so we, to be able to have a program that has a universal list, we need to recognize all the MRF operators and try to get them all up to a certain level. And so how we do that is a big question, but it gives you a sense of a lot of burden is put on us to be able to identify what goes in or out. 
And so we can only do our best. And I hope that after tonight, you can, you have a sense of being able to do a little bit better. So thank you. And I don't know if you have any questions for me. So I'll go ahead and read off, Cheryl, some of the questions that have come up in the chat, if you could answer them. Um, so they said, what do we do with items that are recyclable, but not acceptable in the blue bin? For example, a plastic number five, something like a salad container. So um, some containers, uh, if it's like a deli container, it may be acceptable if it's not styrofoam and if it's not black. But if it's not acceptable, it has to go in the trash. Okay, another question is, do black plastic- If you're not plastic... happy with it, you should- Go ahead. I was gonna say, you could contact the manufacturer and say, you should put your packaging, you should use packaging that's acceptable in my, ta my town's program. Okay. The next question is, do, do black plastic, you said no black plastics, does that include takeout containers? Yep. All black plastics. Okay. And so, you know, an example, you know, black plastic. And the reason being is that the optical sorters, um, they, they like, they basically look at stuff and they can identify what type of material it is. But somehow for the, the black, they can't pick up, it picks it up as nothing. And so they don't recognize it and it ends up contaminating other materials. Okay. The, the next question is pizza boxes. Um, you've just said that they were all in now, but I think uh, before people were tearing off the tops. So the pizza boxes with grease soaked into the cardboard, are they okay or not? They are okay. We just don't want your crust, no anchovy. And if you have a liner, take out the liner because often pizza places that have a liner, that's super, super greasy. Um, the place that I have uses a paper liner, but no liners, no crust, eat your pizza. <laughs> the next question is, so you said you can't bag things in plastic, but can I bag things in paper bags and put them in my bin to recycle? Yes, as long as your paper bag does not have a cord handle, if you know what I mean that some paper bags now have paper handles and some paper bags have like that woven, that woven fiber. They can't take those woven fiber. That's considered a tangler. That'll rip up and tangle. So a regular paper bag is fine. Okay. Good question. The next question is to clarify, if the cap is on the jar, bottle or container, it's okay, but it's, it's not okay if the cap is off Correct. No loose bottle caps. So this is okay, but this is out, right? So this is okay because it's on the container, but a loose bottle cap is just going to go through the grade and then um, contaminate the glass. Okay. Uh, next question is, when you, when you go for the wrap program at your local store, can you put all your plastic bags and film inside the largest bag when you drop them at like a shop right or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you're not familiar with the wrap program, you just wanna make sure that all your plastic bags and plastic film are clean and dry. So no crumbs, no food and no moisture. <laughs> now there, some people have heard that plastic bags and film are not actually being recycled at Stop and Shop. Um, do you have a suggestion for a reliable place to recycle film and plastic bags? Yeah, so um, the wrap program is currently in the, uh, we're in the early stages of a refresh because COVID made it very complicated. Um, some people thought you couldn't take plastic bags, which was not the case. Some people decided not to take bags, which was fine temporarily. Some people put their container back out. Some people didn't. Some people are collecting it, but don't think they're markets. Right now, plastic film has really, really strong markets. And so we wanna make sure that all of our stores are collecting plastic film. So uh, it's really sort of a store by store and it has to do with the manager. So I'm currently working with recycling coordinators around the state to be able to visit stores and talk to the managers and let them know that the markets are good and they should start participating in the program and we can help make sure that they understand where their markets are. So often the, the, the retail chain is participating, 
but then sometimes it doesn't trickle down to the actual individual store. And so we are trying to create a toolkit actually for store managers. So I don't have a great answer for you. So find a store that's taking it and um, be patient until your store starts up again. The next question is, how do we know our hauler actually recycles? Um, and I've heard this multiple times from different people that everyone looks at their hauler picking up their trash and recycling on the same day. And there's a perception that it's all getting tossed in the same place. Well, hopefully it's not getting picked up by the same truck. If it's getting picked up by the same truck, you should contact the department. Um, they cannot commingle. It's actually illegal to commingle. And there's no facility that separates trash from recyclables. We um, have heard a number of, you know, we get a complaints all the time around the state. Um, and with COVID, you may have the time. Follow them. Take a little video. Tell us what they're doing. And it will help us understand that maybe they really do have a separated, you know, maybe their truck does have a se separation in it and they can collect it the way that they're saying. But most likely that's not the case. We want to make sure that the material, of course, is being recovered. I would say most haulers are participating and most haulers are doing a good job, but um, you know, there's always a few bad apples. The next question is, do other countries other than China buy our recycled materials? Oh, yes. Um, China was not the major um, buyer uh, nationally and definitely uh, Connecticut didn't really sell that much to China at all. Think about geography. Um, there's a reason that Oregon and California were freaking out when the China National Sword was hit really hard because those were their markets. What happened is that they started taking over the East Coast or the Eastern Seaboard markets impacting us months later. And then it became a little bit competitive. And then the cleaner the materials we had, the more competitive we were to be able to ride out the storm. But um, yeah, we, there's a lot of places to sell, a lot of different Southeastern Asian countries, as well as even Canada, depending on the material. And then of course, domestic, there's always been domestic markets too. They're just increasing, which is actually a good thing in terms of jobs and local economy and state's economy, et cetera. Okay, two questions about envelopes. One is Envelopes that are paper outside and bubble wrap inside, are they recyclable? And the second one is, what about envelopes with plastic windows? Okay, so uh, you broke up a little bit, but I think you're talking about manila envelopes that have bubble wrap on the inside? Yes, Those that's are one. out. You, you, trash. Sadly, you can't put them in the recycling bin and you can't put them in the film program. And then the other was regular envelopes with the little plastic window. Right. Those are fine. Those are fine, those are acceptable. So if you're talking about manila envelopes, padded envelopes with paper could be reused, but not recycled. Paper with the, the bubble wrap on the inside is also trash, so reuse them if you can. And then the only ones that are acceptable are the plastic bubble envelopes that are plastic on the outside and plastic on the inside. Those are acceptable in the wrap program if you take off the label. Yeah. There is a question on where do we find out the guidelines on the textile recycling at our transfer station and other contaminants we should be aware of? Um, I don't know if Cheryl knows That's a question knows for it. you, Becky. I know, I know. <laughs> so, so Bay State is our textile recycler that um, we have a, a um, basically a little trailer at the transfer station that you can drop off things. And I believe that there is a sign on that trailer that says what you can put in and what you can't. But if there isn't, I will make sure that we either put that on our website um, to make sure that you, it's very clear what you can put in and what you cannot put in. And I, just, to, just to make sure everyone's aware, uh, you guys are all very uh, good recyclers, it sounds like from Cheryl's quiz, but you know also that you can recycle scrap metal at our transfer station, batteries, there's an electronics trailer, you can bring all of your electronics, they can all be recycled. Um, we are doing a mattress recycling program um, where we don't actually have a mattress program where you can bring it to the transfer station. You have to pay a small fee, um, but there is a Bye Bye Mattress or Park City Green, which is in Bridgeport, which does recycle mattresses, 85% of the mattresses. And we are going to be doing a pickup program in May. So stay tuned. We will send you the dates of that and you can recycle your mattresses that way. 
Um, there's also going to be a composting program at the library on April 20th, I believe, at 630. Mary, I don't know if you know the exact time, um, but if you are looking at food scrap recycling, we are trying to find a way to do a municipal level food scrap recycling program, but it's, it's very hard because we have a private hauler system and we just can't find a way to make it cost effective. But there are definitely, if you want your food scraps picked up, there are two different um, groups in town that will come pick up your food scraps for a small fee. Plus there's a lot of composting opportunities in town. So please reach out to Sustainable Fairfield Task Force if you want any more information on that, we'd be happy to do that. We'll be doing a, you know, different composting webinars as well, just to teach you how to compost at home. Um, we also are looking at a small glass recycling project, uh, a pilot that we would be doing at our transfer station. So you'd have to drop your glass off, but there is a market for glass an increasing market for glass if it is separated. Um, oh, here's, here's another uh, question. You mentioned the recycling is the law in Connecticut, but I've worked at businesses that did not recycle because the company that picked up the trash didn't offer recycling. So what about business recycling? That's a great question. So again, the law states everyone must recycle regardless of if you're in a house with a mouse, the box with a fox, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't matter what structure you're in, everyone must recycle. So if you're, if you're a hauler, your hauler is actually required by law to offer recycling pickup if they are offering you trash service. And um, you can contact the department and let them know that your hauler is not abiding by the law or complying by the law and let us know. Or you could demand your hauler to offer that service and say, why aren't you offering it to me? You're required to. Um, but they are required to offer that service. The only way that um, haulers don't need to do it is if you are doing a voluntary program, maybe your town allows small businesses to bring recyclables to the transfer station, and then you would have a notification that says, no, I self haul it to the transfer station, so the hauler doesn't need to help me. That's the only way that um, they can get out of that uh, law. But we need your help. The department is pretty tiny these days and um, the beauty of the law, it says everyone must recycle. So we do need your help in notifying the department if something isn't going right and that we do wanna hear from you. So, so thank you. Um, I just wanna say something. So that was me asking. Um, so even if the company, so it was, it's a building that houses several different businesses and it was just said that the the contract that the building has, they don't have the recycling capability. So that you would say is illegal. Yeah, so that's on two levels. You have your property manager that's responsible and then you have the hauler that's responsible and both parties are not in compliance. And so your property manager needs to um, provide access to all of its tenants, the tenants meaning all the different businesses and then the hauler needs to provide that service under the contract they have with the property manager. It may cost extra, but they have to abide by the law. It's the same like if you were a mall, right? The mall is owned by one property, you know, that runs the mall, but then each business may do their own pickup, but it has to be a service that's provided by the property or the building owner, the building manager. Got it. And can you just repeat one more time why a regular manila envelope, uh, those yellow envelopes that just have the clasp, nothing bubble, nothing bubbly inside, oh, the recyclable? I missed that part. I only heard the bubble part. So if it's a plain manila envelope without any plastic liner or paper liner, yeah, you're, that's fine. That can go in the recycling bin. I, I appreciate the clarification. I definitely kind of blipped out at that point, so I didn't hear this whole question. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any more questions, Cheryl? You've been awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any uh, any other questions that anyone has? I would just like to mention uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. This has been really educational. Um, it, the introduction to composting program that uh, Becky had mentioned, it is, it's another virtual program and it is Tuesday, April 20th, and it's at 6.30. 
uh, and you can find you can sign up for it on the library's calendar at fairfieldpubliclibrary.org. We're going to have master composters Mary Hogue and Dan Martins um, showing us uh, more information about that. And um, I, this has been great, very educational. I'll turn it over to uh, Representative Leeper if she has some final words. I just realized that it's better for me to eat more pizza than Pringles now. <laughs> Recycling goals. So I'm, I'm excited to, that, uh, to learn that. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'll just I'll just uh, reiterate what everyone said and thank you so much to the library and the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force for partnering and Cheryl for for bringing your expertise here and I'll just give one last plug to the composting program too because about a year ago Sustainable um, Fairfield Task Force got me into composting and and it's been great and I've been doing it with my two little boys and you know it's been nice to feel like we're doing a little bit of good for the planet. Um, Cheryl, I think everyone here found this just so incredibly helpful as we all try to do our best with our waste. So we can now do a little bit better. Thank you. Well, thank you for everybody for participating. I appreciated everybody with the thumbs up, thumbs down. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be well. We'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I thank Hi, you. Everyone. Thank you.